Hello and welcome back to the Handstand Cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my co-host, Mikhail Christiansen. How is it going, Mikhail? It's uh, going pretty well, I'd say. Um, actually in Norway right now, uh, just outside of Oslo, playing a bunch of uh, shows for children with a, a Norwegian performance called Fritt Fram, which basically translates to free for all, uh, roughly. Um, it's uh, a show by a company called Company Two, uh, which is a nice little circus company made by two friends of mine, and we have this kids show together. And yeah, we're actually getting to play some shows in this in 2020. I'm rather surprised that um, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, it's definitely one of those ones. Uh, I, uh, basically, I think everyone I know who performs has, been, if they've done one show. Or one walkabout, or one anything this summer. They've been pretty lucky. <laughs> uh, most of them haven't. Most people are uh, kind of struggling. I think a lot of people are eager to get back onto the scene. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, it's kind of it's going to be a tough a bit one. Frustrating. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. I think it's going to be a very uh, longer type of situation for performing artists, since we're basically bound to, or at least a lot of us are bound to, also having the access for international travel and all of that to be uh, yeah. to, to make it feasible to make things go around from only performing so yeah definitely not the best things the best times for these things um, but I do, I do know a couple of people that are still able to do the projects that they had planned and uh, that things yeah. are actually going through as planned but it's um, it's definitely not everyone and we we also had to do a bunch of like adjustments to our show. Uh, yeah, the one we were saying. It's like it, usually in the end of the show, like we would since it's a kids show, we invite the kids onto our stage. Like our stage is a little circle we've drawn on the floor, and we allow them in and they play and they pay, they they draw on the floor and stuff. But that can't happen now. So <laughs> they they instead get a bunch of chalk from us and they are allowed to go and play with it outside. But it still works as a show, so fun to do. That's just one of those ones. It's like, here, children, here's a load of chalk. Yeah. Now off you go and mess yeah. someone else's wall yeah. with it. Now fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. You kind of just reminded me, actually, of a show by the Gandini Juggling Project. In one of the shows, they had a... I can't remember the show. Uh, but in one section, someone was juggling five balls. I think it was Anyaki Siestra, if I pronounce his name right, and whoever does it now. And everyone was coming up to him, and he was juggling five balls. They're trying to put him off by like shouting in his face, uh, not pushing him, but just aggravating him. But then I think it culminated in like people taking mouthfuls of water and spitting it in his face to try get him to stop juggling. <laughs> and he kept going. He's a very very talented juggler, so he's a uh, he just kept going machine. And, uh, I think maybe that show will uh, have to be altered in light of <laughs> recent events. Uh, yeah. Where else? Sorry, I had something else to say. Uh, it doesn't matter. I will come back to it. Anyway, I'm going to get on to the topic of tonight's show. We are going to talk about all things flagging in handstands. We're going to try to give you a bit of a definition of what we consider to be flagging. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about flagging on two arms, the different shapes, uh, flagging and how it relates to the one arm handstand, flexibility. What else are we going to cover? I guess we're going to talk about, um, yeah, like the various ways it functions in a one arm handstand and kind of what uh, or how to define it um, in itself yeah. as well. And yeah, the strength components and like why you should train flags. Um, at different level or like at different points in your process because i think that flag type of work can be very beneficial even on earlier uh, levels and even yeah um, it, like you don't need to have a one arm to actually practice like certain yeah, types of flags i think uh i think first we should probably define the flag itself and what we mean by the flagging action so for me, and I suppose a bit of a debate between us as well as what we define as this, but uh, for me, I define flag bending as bending the waist sideways. 
this is this is flagging and handstand. What your legs and pelvis are doing, it doesn't really matter the configuration. What I'm looking for is this angulation of the side bend basically would be what I'd call a flagging action. Mm. This could be a deep flag. It could be a straddle flag, a diamond, a tuck. But this intent to bend the side, either a small amount or a big amount, is the flagging action. Mm. What do you think? Would you concur or yeah. anything into that? Yeah, I think that like any sort of basically when you start <clears throat> tilting the uh, the hip kind of as a unit on top of the um, on top of the torso, uh, it's rather like basically I would say that if we're trying to do a flag, you are trying to to then bend the uh, or to move the hip laterally um, into kind of a side bend on top of your torso. Now, how the torso responds to that and the arms respond to that, that is a different thing uh, because there are, there are options for the body structure to respond to that movement. Um, and like the kind of most, how to say, technically correct uh, for lack of a better word would be of course keeping your arms straight and locked as in a normal handstand only bending at the sides and keeping kind of the arms straight and all of that whereas yeah. that is that is kind of the option that we're perhaps training for if we want to do kind of professional style looking hand balancing but the response can also be very heavy arm bending for example or closing of yeah. the shoulders and moving kind of um or moving like I, I even know extremely good hand balancers who deliberately close their shoulders a bit when they do full flags. Uh, a friend of mine does that, yeah, uh, and his his full flags are fantastic. So there are options in terms of like how to respond to it, but yeah, in general, you are definitely yeah, right. Yeah, you just reminded me actually some capoeira stuff I've seen before. I'm gonna segue slightly, but. The the person I can remember in particular, who I can't remember where I seen it. I think it's probably been this a street show. He had these fantastic amount of his splits was pretty good, not not super super amazing, but it was pretty good. His side bend was immense. He was like all the way, just really flexible in his sides. I just really remember this. And then he was doing the capoeira, Django fighting fighting against people, Rhoda, the Rhoda, that's the one. And But he was using a huge amount of bending in the arm combined with sending the legs sideways in response to this mm. to control and change his direction in and out of the handstand mm. while using a very deep flagging action. So you can kind of get an idea of what that might look like. If we think of, a, think of someone going into a squat, from a squat into a bent arm handstand with quite a wide stance while getting the leg almost up and over to the other side before the second leg has come off the ground. Mm. So this kind of, he had a very high degree of flexibility in the side. So uh, Yeah, I've seen yeah, just, seen seen a lot of those. Like there's even this one famous uh, capoeira video of some guy doing, like his arms are basically bent at 90, at 90 degrees to the side. So like his head is barely off the floor and he's doing like basically that kind of around the world thing where you go Mexican yeah. flag, pike, me uh, flag, Mexican pi uh, flag. Uh, so he goes like all the way around and he does that like on heavily bent arms. It's really cool. Um, yeah. And also there's this B-boy, uh, B-boy physics is his name, Korean legendary B-boy. And he used to do some like crazy, basically like flag spins where he would, I've seen him a couple of times out of some like freeze combination do like, like, I don't know if it's like a full turn in a flag before stopping and holding it for like a second and a half <laughs> before dropping to the next freeze is absolutely crazy. But yeah, but yeah, like I think the, um, yeah, there are many ways that this can be done, but I think the obvious, um, in terms of resisting gravity, since that is what we're trying yeah. to do, uh, even when bending sideways, uh, the more you can stay on a straight arm, the uh, better on average it'll be. Uh, like, of course, if you have no shoulder flexibility, it's going to feel a lot heavier to do that. But if, yeah. it, like, like if we assume that you have a structure that will uh, support kind of a straight arm flag where the arm stays reasonably close to your head, it might move away slightly depending on your, your proportions and flexibility. We'll get to that. But um, 
that will at least um, ha- kind of um, it will be a more eff- effective way of doing it on average, and particularly if you want to relate it to hand balancing in general. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's one of these things I've been thinking about. Just to it's something that popped into mind a month or two ago is when we were training someone to become a hand balancer or learn handstands. One of the first things we do is obviously get them a handstand. The next thing we do is get control of leg movements. And the next thing we do is begin to control the waist movements. And if you think about what we introduce at this time, we introduce pressing, which is the extension and flexion of the core. We introduce Mexicans. And then we introduce side bending, which is the flagging. So we're beginning to get like this core as a box idea. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously it's not exactly like that, but we're training the core on top of the shoulders to manipulate that in combination with the leg movements. Mm. It's something like kind of interesting thing of like we we establish the straight line, then we begin to play with like over and under balance in the different positions and the leg movements and that. And then we begin to go, well, let's see how far we can push this by flexing, extending, laterally flexing, and also rotation. Mm. If we think about the rotational movements as well at that stage so we're beginning to sort of juice the core muscles up i think and yeah get them it's, in control it's, it's very common to like you'll see if you see hand balancers do or like any stop or hand balancers that do a lot of side bend type stuff they'll have rather well developed obliques and um, serratus muscles since those yeah. are very involved when it comes to all the side bending um but i think it's um it's a very important element, I think, in terms of the intermediate practitioner that is like, I love to with people that are like getting kind of quite confident on their two arm handstands to start yeah. like challenging them with lateral movements. And like uh, the the first thing I always say is, is like, we're not training for one arm. We're trying to understand what the lateral movements of the legs in the handstand mean. Those are very yeah. different things. We're not we're not trying to set you up for a one arm, but we are doing early preparation, which will make you at least have a frame of reference when we start practicing one arms. So that like then you have a much shorter way because you've actually done these things and they can be done stomach to wall, then they can be done freestanding. And you don't need to then do these side flexions slash flags uh, so deep in the beginning, but you can start learning about like what happens to your waist as you do so and for most people when you shift uh, and you you start doing this kind of side bending action meaning that uh, how, how we very often cue it by imagining that you're bringing one of the legs closer to the floor which if you keep that action going and you can stay on your arms you will reach the floor with a leg in the end but you're initiating this action to what degree you can keep control of and What happens to people that are starting out learning this is that they will already at this point be starting to uh, to be challenged with rotation uh yeah because the upper leg won't necessarily stay in line with the lower leg and the the legs might even move in their sockets and not stay fixed with the hips as a unit and it starts causing these same type of rotational problems that people struggle with on one arm except on a much earlier level yeah it's definitely a it's definitely something I noticed. I think it comes down to one of these things is like a lot of people aren't that flexible in their sides, but most people are flexible in extension. Mm. So when you think about, oh, let's go, let's go flag and they go, okay, I'm going to go into a deep. They hit the limit quite early on what they actually can side bend either for flexibility or structure or just control reasons. But then it's quite easy to escape the flexibility or keep moving in the arching direction of the lower back into the extension mm. and that generally like you put a bit move in two directions you have rotation yeah. we have side mm. and then we extend yeah. and then we uh have rotation mm. so it's kind of interesting i think this kind of linearity of training is always interesting where we're like okay we're just going to move in one straight direction and then the problems occur and then once you can move in this kind of cross like manner a lot of like things a lot of a lot of just general movement uh, disciplines rely on this kind of like teaching straight lines first, then teaching the curves mm. because your ability to control your curves and your lines gives you the circles, mm. but not necessarily the other way around. Mm. So it's this kind of being very strict on this kind of lateral movement. Yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, and of course, like another another um, element that goes into that too is that like, or when you start doing like early, early kind of flag preparation work uh, on two arms, is that like, oh hey, suddenly you're carrying seventy uh, thirty of your weight rather than fifty fifty, yeah. which will be a lot more demanding, and you might not respond correctly to to that amount of pressure in your shoulder, um, and the shoulder might move. Uh, and as you know, if shoulders move in handstand, you're going to have to deal with it or you fall down. So um, <laughs> it's um, it's definitely a kind of, I, th I think it is in a, in a very interesting and a very uh, underestimated challenge for people that are like, you don't need to be that far ahead, I think, for handstand training before starting to include this. And I do think that there might exist this idea that, oh yeah, I shouldn't be starting to train those exercises because that's one arm training. No, it isn't. Like for me, yeah. doing these exercises isn't. It is has nothing to do with one arm training at that point in time. It has about it. It is about learning to understand what the lateral dimension on a two arm handstand means, which is basically, I like you said, like as you learn to pike, as you learn to tuck, as you learn to straddle, you're learning about like a certain dimension on your two arm handstand, and the sideways one is just a more complicated, heavier, and. Uh, uh, and then a ver variation that sets you up for later work, whereas like yeah. it's just very important to iterate that the the goal of doing this exercise on an early level isn't one arm yet, but later on it will help you with a one arm, just as doing a pike handstand will also help you with a one arm, but it's not practicing the one arm to do a pike. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's also a lot to be said for learning the flags as a way of progressively overloading your stacked position mm, indeed as well because yeah. if we think about it like we've got a solid two-arm handstand and we need to put more weight into the side so we train the underbalance direction by pressing obviously whereas we train the weight shift from unilateral by putting more weight as because at 70 30 60 40 increment up and then you can see what happens like if you can maintain a good shoulder stack under this increased loading then you're getting stronger. If you find you're defaulting to the arm, moving away from the ear or bending the arm, you're clearly not pushing or engaging the structure in the right way we want for the handstand at that time if we're trying to maintain a straight arm. Mm. So we can use this as a gauge of like, oh, you know, look at yourself in your video. And you go, oh, okay, I'm bending at 30 degrees. Uh, my arm is not is bending in response to this. Two weeks later, I'm bending at 30 degrees and my arm is staying completely straight and locked on it. Mm. Okay, we have a bit of progressive overload. Mm. It's not necessarily training one arm or training weight shifts or stuff like this, but it's beginning to build up more scapular strength on this plane. Yeah, I agreed. And like the, I think think the control, like of course, the the stronger you are, the more potential control you have. It's not necessarily so that like I am stronger, therefore I have a ton more control. Um, but if you have the strength. Um, that is specific for the one arm hand, or like for the handstand itself, like being able to carry your weight 70-30 uh, um, compared to not being able to carry your weight 70-30. It's, it's a very obvious, um, uh, or like there, there, there is a linear relationship and there is like this, yeah. this is better to be able to do if you want to be stronger on your hands, which you likely are if you're training hand balancing. So... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be strong on my hands, but I'm training handstands. Well, just want to be, be as weak as physically possible, as yeah, incapable. It, like I want to be the incapable hand balancer. But um, it's it's also um, like one of the reasons, or or maybe even the primary reason. No, it's not the primary, but it's as important as this this thing of learning about the lateral dimension. It is to teach that the lateral dimension needs to happen through some sort of side flexion to some degree or other uh, if it happens on two arms. If you're going to basically, if you're going to use this two arm uh, lateral movement uh, to teach a one arm handstand later on, we might as well set you up in a situation where you are learning about the trajectory you move, want to move your legs and hips when you set up a one-arm handstand. Because you could also yeah. move the hips and legs in the way that you walk on your hands, where instead of instead of tilting the hips sideways and bringing 
like one leg down and the other leg responds by going up. Instead of that, you shift the hips sideways entirely. So the hips stay fully uh, parallel to the floor and you shift the hips sideways. And this is this is like the number one um, issue that I see with people learning one arm. It's like everyone does the same mistake on this because the body thinks that this is the right direction to move. And they're, yeah. they're just not getting that diagonal relationship between the hips and the arm, as you will see on partner on practically every single pro hand balancer out there you'll see one leg is lower the other leg is higher and the the belly button area is over their hand uh, and the hip joint itself is kind of in line with that line of the legs and there are yeah there are different kind of i'd say uh dimensions and like hyperextended elbows will matter and all these kind of things and how much you need to kind of bring your hip in that direction and it is possible to do a one arm with this kind of fully horizontal hip angle, uh, but it's not efficient on average. Yeah, it's definitely uh, one of those weird ones. Uh, before we ship onto one arm stuff, I'd like to actually just talk about the, what I consider the two main shoulder positions when we're learning to flag, and that I think they're both important and there's no right or wrong. So we have we have our normal stacked shoulder position where we load up the. I always look at the person's butt cheek and I want to see them flag so their butt cheek is going outside the, the sideline of the body. And they stay on top of the shoulders and this will begin to load more weight onto one side just by definition. But then there's the other type of flag where I specifically instruct people to counter shift their shoulders in the opposite direction. So you're opening up the shoulder angle between the ears, whatever that might be for you. And this is one of the ways where like, where you can get very deep flags depending on your flexibility, very deep side bend or Im very impressive looking angles. And it's one of those ones I always say to people, like when I first train and start training them on flags, I, I just tell them, go to wall and give them two, three sets of three flags and hold the last one. And I don't tell them anything about the shoulders because I want to see what they naturally do with the shoulders because mm. it's always interesting to me to see how people solve the issue of the flag <clears> with the shoulders. Mm. And it's about 50-50 on my count where some people will stay, boom, in good handstand position. I'm using a finger quotes there. And the other half will counter shift the shoulders. Mm. And this will keep the weight more 50-50 in the hands. Yeah. And it's classic. not necessarily with a yeah classic. But it's interesting because I think it's one of these things is like it can be slightly down to side flexibility. It's like you get to a certain level. Then if I counter shift the shoulders, it allows me to straighten the body out a bit more. Mm. So if you want to get like, you know, touch the ground, if you're the classic one, if your split isn't super big or you haven't got super long legs compared to your torso, you want to touch the ground at your feet. And, you know, then you kind of have to start getting into these, uh, side shifting shoulders mm. whereas if you stay on top of the shoulders and even if you bend the same degree as you did on the side shift you're not going to be able to touch the ground or get as deep visually into the flag though the configuration of the hip and the torso would be bent and curved at the same degree yeah so it's kind of interesting yeah like, it's also like yeah go, go on sorry yeah it's also one of these things i uh I really like this one because it's an interesting way for people to begin to experience the other shoulder positions that can happen in a one arm handstand as well. Cause we have this kind of open position mm. and then it also like, you know, even if they're stronger as well, I'll, I'll let, this is an interesting one. Actually, if I have someone who is a mega beast, like proper strong, like planche master kind of strength, but not that great at hand balance, getting them to this like flag with legs together heavy flag and then just say push you know push the shoulders horizontal keep them horizontal and it's very surprising the amount of them that can actually get into what would be a possible four finger support or even into a questionable balance but very nicely arranged full flag using this idea of like shoulders go away mm. hips flag bends down and just rely on having brute force shoulders to do it but it's a uh, it's an interesting one, like where it's, you know, if you were to set them up with a good hand stand and good one arm and try bring them through that pathway to get there, they take some time, but because they have the strength yeah. and they kind of can use this, the weight shift of the hand to keep a kind of, yeah, you just it's like almost lean. like a curved planche. Yeah. yeah. You just lean, you basically just lean away. Like it's, it's very much how I approached one arms when I first started, um, because I had like the air baby strength and like all of that stuff. So. 
Like yeah. full flag to me was accessible really early on because I could it was bent arm and all that and I could just lean lean away really like a lot because of the power. Um but like interesting thing also with, with full flag, like uh the I find it easier to get into kind of like my maximal depth of a flag with a full flag than any other because like there's just so much weight pulling me down in that direction and I know that I can always counteract that with a force. Uh, yeah. But it's uh it's it's definitely like if I want if I want to set up a nice flag kind of like in terms of the standard uh uh how to say aesthetical model of like straight arm and all that like I'd, I'd have to um do do a proper setup because like i can just find hold the straight arm full flag but um if i'm not detailed with the setup like the easiest thing for me to do is bend the arm like that is the most efficient setup there uh in terms of controlling it because if i for example do have like a svichka and just like side bend fast and go into a flag I will most likely bend the arm because that is where I can kind of catch the the balancing aspect the most. But but back to what you said about the the shoulder shifting. Um like I used to have really good kind of toe touches on each side and the toe touches is it's a very classical exercise and it's one in this kind of the circus community is very common because people that start with hand balancing or like go towards higher levels of hand balancing usually have that level of like hip flexibility so that like they're their straddles are massive yeah. and so on so like kind of the toe taps on the floor where you just like side flex until you touch the floor is kind of a very classical move that you can see you see a lot of people do and it is a very nice thing to be able to do um and if if you kind of have those kind of generalized quote unquote nice criteria where you're able to keep your arms fully straight and locked and you just bend in the side you can touch touch each side with yeah with your right split easily um like um that is that is great it's kind of a it's a nice um um nice prerequisite whereas for me like um i when i do that on my left side after my like still all these years after my like right and the injury that i had in my right side slash lower back area when i bend yeah. towards the left and particularly in the straddle flag i you see me do like a lot more side side shifting away from the arm than like that should that that i should need for such an easy move for myself Uh, and i actually need to concentrate quite a lot to keep the arm in position when i do that just because like after that injury it became kind of the ingrained way of doing it was just move the arm away a little bit more uh when doing any kind of uh side side shifts on my left arm Uh, and there's an there's another interesting thing that happens also when you when you do like regardless of if you shift away or a, a lot or not is that like if you keep a straight arm a lot like the, you get some a, a degree of pressure into your biceps like similarly to a planche but of course a lot yeah. less intense but like you need to kind of like it's as if you as if how can i describe it if your hand is on the floor and as and as your legs go outside it's almost as if you kind of have to counteract in the direction of pulling your arm towards the center which you really aren't of course but like your your bicep has to kind of brace uh the, yeah. the straightness of the arm in the same way that like the the bicep um, braces the straightness of the arm in a planche yeah it's definitely uh it's even if you were to look at the anatomy of what's going on there when you start having the arm up overhead then opening it out to the side as you approach 45 degrees it's when it begins to link up the chain that connects the the thumb the forearm the biceps and the pec minor mm. so if you think about the if you've gone to my youtube to check it out the there's a wall handstand pec minor fascial stretch in there and you can feel it how it works and it'll give you an idea of like why this is intense on the bicepius maximus mm. that's a new muscle by the way <laughs> bicepius maximus uh but yeah it's definitely when you open up that angle and it's just to sort of segue onto the one arm topic it's one of those things that i have narrowed down that when people start having bicep jank and shoulder impingements it's generally when they're learning one arm and they start opening the shoulder angle out and haven't really conditioned in that position mm. it's one of those ones definitely uh 
if I see someone doing that balancing too much and they don't correct it, that's when they'll start getting a bicep tendon issue yeah. from that position. Yeah, I've seen that. First. I've had I've had that too. Um, yeah. I think it comes especially if you do like rough corrections where like you fall out and you kind of like you go really quickly out with the arm to kind of save yourself. Of course, like yeah, loads definitely. of force in the joint. Uh, yeah, strictly, yeah, yeah. When people are learning to balance and they're in that position and they're out and then they're like, oh, my elbow's jank or my shoulder's jank. I'm like, told you so. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's, I suppose, one thing, I suppose we start talking about one arms and then we're getting yeah. to that topic. There's just on, on one other thing, though, that yeah. I'd like to say just before we enter fully into the one arm domain, this relates a lot and that is like, obviously, your le- the level of your side flexibility is going to make a massive difference for flags. You can see people who are, there are some people out there that just have like these, ab, like it looks abnormal, the amount they can bend in the side. Very often you'll see contortionists like that, that just like, it just looks as if kind of half of their body disappears when they do uh, when they do kind of a flag. And I, I have a friend of mine, uh, Joey Martinho from uh, Portugal. She's a really damn good hand balancer and she has pretty good flags, yeah. no doubt about it. And when she was in Stockholm some years ago, uh, we were like, we were training some flags and I just said like, yeah, yeah, try grabbing the bar and doing a full flag. And she bends like, she's, she's kind of, she's contortionist. Uh, she has a contortion back basically. Like she's not training yeah. contortion, but she has like extreme back flexibility. Um, and also her sides are just nuts. And like, it was as if she just like bent too far. Like it was just, <laughs> it, it was it was just weird to look at it. it was just like as if you literally cut her in half with an or like as if her torso was a, a a large piece of cake and you just remove one very big piece of the cake and you just like fold her in half it's just like <laughs> where the hell are your anything like it, it just looks where are your organs gone yeah, it, it just looks mental yeah. and <clears throat> loads of people i've seen many many people that have this um and like of course that is going to require its own level of strength to do but you'll see because like i just mentioned this now with a bicep for example for me when i do yeah. a lot of these like it feels like if if i do like conditioning sets of flags i'll feel kind of my bicep quite a lot because i'm one of the people that like there is no way in hell regardless that i can bend even like half as much as she can for example and yeah like i've also tried in terms of um side flexibility to grab onto a bar with my free arm putting my uh my balance arm just to- totally close to my head so I'm basically touching and then bending as far as I can like we're talking as far as I possibly could bend until like there's yeah. just bone on bone block there's nowhere else to go and I do not reach a full kind of flat there so the only way for me to reach yeah. a full flat is to to go to that point and then allow the arm to go away from the head either then it can stay straight or it can bend but it needs to go away or else it won't reach that point and that away from head thing when you run a one arm handstand obviously means then like there is an increase in the angle and and more required force of kind of the arm and the bicep to then pull in the direction of your head to counteract the weight so it's obvious that like the the strength to flexibility ratio and how they relate is very it's very interesting and very kind of complicated in flags because you can like there's so many like the body configuration and the body structure starts mattering at one point to a quite a significant yeah degree. yeah exactly there's one of uh yeah depending on lumbar spines lumbar spines are always quite interesting because if we think of the vertebra it can be very different shaped and very different configurations in people as well as the spacing, the amount of space between your pelvis and your ribs. So some people can have more space here. This just allows, there's less bone on bone contact. The processes on the vertebra can be thicker and smaller. So this can allow more lateral flexing. And there's this kind of, you see this with people who have hypermobility as well, is they are able to get more bend in the lumbar laterally to the point where they're, if you were to look at the butt cheek or the sacrum, mm. it kind of stays inside the line of the body. Yeah. So they're able to get this bend that a lot of people are just not going to be able to do it. You just basically need to be hypermobile in this area. And they can kind of keep the mass of the hips onto the inside of the body. So it would reduce the lateral bending 
loading, I suppose, mm. to be able to keep more of the weight centered over the arm or over the two arms even, or one arm if they're doing on that, without it going too far to the outside. Exactly. This which in turn, thing. yeah. So it's very interesting when you see this. You're just like, oh, you know, I get excited when I see someone who has a hypermobile spine in this direction because it's uh, it, always interesting. It, it's, like that, um, it's like that... It's like that... That uh, Ukrainian contortionist Victoria Dziuba or something. I probably butcher her name now, but um, you should go check her out because she is possibly one of the craziest contortionist hand balancers in the world, like maybe in history. Like she's, it's pretty fucking mental what she is able to do. But yeah. like her and a lot of those at that level, like. We're, we're not long no, any longer talking about like, oh, yeah, just bend in the side. It's like they put their ass on their shoulder. Like if you yeah. look at some of the pictures, like her butt cheeks are next to her scapula. Like um, yeah. and we're not talking like in the close proximity. Like they're literally like touching her scapula. So it is just like it. it's it's like when I see that, I, I'm really fascinated by it. But like it's just it's it's. It's alien. It is not something that I can relate to whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a, uh, yeah, there's all this kind of thing. It's like, particularly when start, people start trying to find something unique in their style or taking one thing that their body can do and pushing it to the limit that other bodies can't. Then mm. you're just like, oh, wait. Yeah, can't do that. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Even if I trained for another lifetime. No, it's just not gonna yeah, happen. Yeah, just basically you need new parents and like yeah. you 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 need to re-roll your character basically. You need to pass me the shotgun. I'm gonna re-roll. <laughs> was that a bit dark? It's okay. I believe in reincarnation, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, where are we? So yeah, I suppose we want to get onto the one arm handstand as well and the flying yes. in the one arm because that's kind of interesting. So I suppose like if we go back to our original definition of flagging would be bending at the waist sideways laterally and then the one arm handstand has a small degree of it we don't need to be able to go super deep but we need to be able to do it to set up our shoulder ability to push but then we have the whole flagged family of one arm handstands where the intent is to bend as deep in the side as possible and i think these are kind of misunderstood i suppose in some ways because a lot of people would say oh there there's no waist bend in a one-arm handstand but there is in the setup there is a diagonal hip position and we set the one-arm handstand up by it's almost like moving your weight over your head moves over and then your hip pushes out if i sit on my feet mm. it's the same thing but my i set up the diagonal angle of the hips and then i push up and underneath it and that straightens the spine out from the bottom Whereas, you know, when you get advanced, you can do this all in one step. Yeah. But yeah, and when you're learning, sorry, when you're learning, it's good to like separate all the stages of the one arm up into different things, just like any other movement we do. We'll break it down as the easiest bits. Then we go, okay, we'll set the hips diagonal with no rotation. Okay, stage one, good. Then we'll push. Okay, do we rotate or fall out? Okay, well, then the problem's in the push. Whereas if we do it all at once and we fall out, we don't understand what's going on. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's it's. A, it, I think it's a very like it's an efficient way of setting it up too, because like you can take like you you can even find out what's the problem. Like because if I if I now do a straddle one a straddle two arm handstand, I do a shift in the hips to make sure I get my legs into this diagonal placement I want them. Then I stop there and I stay there for five seconds. If I can stay there for five seconds, that that just basically means okay. And, and like, uh, let's assume that the form is is good. It means that like, okay, there is no problem at that current stage whatsoever because I'm staying there. Like, there's nothing that's moving or going wrong. Then, then I push through the shoulder, which then straightens the C shape of the spine. Which of course, that like the spine will be laterally flexed as I stand fully on two arms. But then, as I push my shoulder underneath this point. Uh, that'll straighten the spine so the straight will the spine will then go from kind of a bent shape and it'll straighten up into a diagonal shape uh, and i then try to go to for example my fingertips and at that point uh, let's say i fall out um and then i know okay well it the reason i fell out was i did 
something wrong as I pushed through the shoulder and I took more weight into that arm and I went to fingertips. Perhaps I did, like, I was too rough with the push. Perhaps I moved my the, the scapula of the free arm too much, etc. Like, there might be other reasons then, but we at least can be sure that, like, <clears throat> the sideways movement in itself was not the cause. While yeah. if I would do all of it at once, I'd... I'd flex sideways, I push in the shoulder extra to take the weight and move the fingertips, like, and I keep falling outwards or I fall inwards or something. Like, I cannot know what was going on. I can't know what was happening, at, at particularly yeah. when you're new at it. Like, when you're good at it, sure. Like, when I shift to a one arm, I shift directly and I push and it's not, not a big deal. Most people can do that even at rather early stages of their one arms but when you're just trying to kind of isolate and understand both cognitively and physically what these components mean it might be very beneficial to just like set that up on two arms and you will have kind of like a flaggy looking two arm and there's an interesting thing that you can see if you see it see a person do this shirtless uh, if you see it from the back you will see or you'll very often see at least that like when a person flexes to the level where they would do their one arm, uh, you just yeah. kind of start to see a crease in their skin on the side, uh, simply yeah. because like the the pelvis is then moving uh, diagonally to the side and the spine is then curving. And then as if you go from that point and you push through the shoulder and the angle of the legs stay exactly the same, like they neither move up or down yeah. in the diagonal or like in the lateral dimension, the legs stay exactly the same, but that push through the shoulders straightens the spine. So that crease either like is is becomes smaller, or it disappears simply because like then yeah. the the spine is suddenly straight though diagonal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's one of those things to understand when we set up the one arm in this manner. What we're doing is we're stretching the opposite side of the spine, and this enables us. Like I always say, the the push comes from the spine and through the shoulder. It doesn't come from the shoulder. Obviously, the shoulder has to achieve its optimal elevation for your own alignment. Once you have that, you don't push it up or down, but you have to get the push from somewhere. And what happens is that push going down lifts the center of mass, but it comes from the spine. It's a whole body action. Like This is one of the things you have to understand. It's not just shoulders. But I think we're getting a bit too into one arm from our flagging adventures. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, we're going to geek out on one arm shoulder position. Uh, yeah. So Fair anyway, enough. so the other thing, what the flagging, being able to move the waist sideways independently of the shoulders, which is our flagging thing, particularly on one arm, is it controls the lateral rebalancing action. Mm. If you start falling to the inside or to the outside when you're doing a one arm, mm. your first sort of port of call when you're learning before you can control it in the hand will be kind of wobbling in a flag sideways, either in the opposite direction you're going to try and buy yourself some time. Mm. And this can be just taught about like, flagging and unflagging and counter flagging can be taught about like just when someone is learning a straight handstand they're going into a little arch they're going into a little pike mm. little arch just kind of wobbling around the center line mm. so this kind of happens just generally not as much repetitions as you might get in a two arm because you'll fall out quite soon yeah but this kind of it is like the flagging action is i suppose it's almost like the heel pulls or the toe pulls of the one arm handstand yeah yeah it could could, could be said to be similar yeah just though, uh, less uh, how to say, and less unilateral, and hence then harder to kind of uh, strengthen specifically, since like there's so many things to react to. But like, yeah. I think also like to to make it to, like the kind of my last comment before we move into kind of one arm flags as kind of the flag shapes of the family. Like yeah. the reason for this. Uh, iterating that we are flexing sideways when doing uh, the setup of a one arm again has nothing to do with that you need to go to like some sort of extreme side flexion to be able to one arm but the two things it is good to be able to bend to control yourself on two arms in a much deeper deeper angle than you want to be in when you balance on a one arm so that if you inevitably move there as you fall out of your one arms you at least have some muscle connection and something to resist with so that you over time become able to do larger corrections as well as smaller ones um, then the other thing is um to just make sure that like if you do not 
um, set up this diagonal angle, you're going to end up with a, with a position that is what I call too high, which means the hip is too ho too horizontal. It is not angled enough above the body, and it will cause you to fall back to two arms again and again and again and again. And you'll do fingertip holds for a million billion years, and you feel that you cannot take off the the hand because you just fall out immediately. This is so yeah. common, and it, I see it all the time. And it's basically like you're you're not training for a one arm because your your hip isn't set up where it needs to be. And um, again, this will also differ for different people. If you have a lot of hyperextension, for example, your hand will be more more under your face when when you are um, when you're fully pushed out on the shoulder, which allows yeah. you to use less uh, side flexion. We've we've mentioned Sami Dineen several times um, yeah. in his cast simply because of that. He has an amazing one arm handstand. He's really damn solid. But he uses a shoulder position that would make me into a terrible hand answer because I do not have, <laughs> I just don't do not have a structure that would efficiently support what he can, what he does. And I'm sure yeah. if he would balance like I do, it would neither be as effective for him. So it's just different ways of that, like different bodies, yeah. different. And this is, the, and we're talking bot like bone structure here. This isn't just like technique that can just magically fix this because like there are certain yeah. things that like, the bones inside our bodies look very different. Like there's not always something we can do about that. However, let us talk there about past the bone saw. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, can call Emmett if you want to change your your <laughs> things. Emmett knows a guy. I know a guy. I know some people who know some people who operate in some people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so the one arm flag family. This is kind of interesting because it kind of gets into the realm of. It has a slightly different shoulder position, I think, for most people. It's very rare that you'll find someone who does a one-arm flag shape, so shape where the intent is to maximize the side bend. We can think of this as our normal straddle flag. We can think diamond, tuck, and straight. You could also think of some of the rotational elements as well. I don't even know the name for that shape, where you do a split, like a front split, and rotate into a flag. This one? So... You do a front split, like a split handstand, and then sideways bend, so you're kind of in a front split flag. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's the one that kind of fakes a one-arm planche, kind of, in aesthetically. Yeah, yeah that mm. one. And uh, you see it a lot in sports acrobatics. Yeah, they use that sometimes. Sports acro, they use it a lot. But, uh, yeah, I don't even know if it's got a name. Someone wants to invent a name and phone it in. We will name it after your name, if your name is good. I'll call it the Hotel uh, of Horror until then. The Hotel of Horror bend, the I Have No Kidneys bend. Uh, yeah, so the intent of the flag in the one arm is, it's very interesting because what I notice on a lot of people is they use a lower shoulder position. And as you kind of touched on, and also close their shoulder position mm. when they begin to go into this position. Now, depending on the person's flexibility, they can either lose some of their thoracic closure and they kind of open, extend the thoracic spine mm. Or they close the shoulder, but they also generally lower it. It's one of those ones I've noticed a lot. It's very common that people go into a lower shoulder position mm. in a flag. And uh, maybe it's just in response to the increased weight, but possibly there's some configuration issues as well of just getting a bit lower, lower the center of mass and just get it over the hand. So yeah, it's definitely it's, one of these things that... Uh, I like to kind of, I always elevate my shoulder like more when i or like i i basically resist and try to keep the elevation but yeah i do know people that like consciously lower the shoulder and i think that that could be a valid uh solution for some and i like a lot of kind of the street workout guys for example like we talked about like uh they when doing flag one arms will have access to a lot more power when since that's where they are really strong so Closing yeah. the shoulders like allows them to work from kind of their their powerful places compared to like resting like fully on the traps like someone who's more hand balancer trained perhaps would, um, yeah. and like what 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 is interesting though for, for like I perform a lot of flags and like of course flags are very very stable positions when you have them solid because like yeah. you, your center mass is very low and you have loads of weight on the outside. And you resist that weight by just pressure. You feel like a strong kind yeah. of 
force in your shoulder and you feel like the pressure in your hand and you don't need to adjust much you just kind of lock it in there and in the beginning like it's it's very heavy on the obliques and like both the kind of the compressed side and the the lengthening side will kind of cramp up a lot from flags some people like even get some issues with their backs from it uh but yeah but essentially you can think of a few people who've broken their floating ribs from going too deep oh yeah, flags yeah, yeah too yeah. heavy yeah that's pretty common. I think I think that's like particular like I don't know like but I've gotten the idea that this is particularly common about among some of those like contortion girls to that have the these extreme bends and then they have the power to go into them and do one arms there. And yeah. And when you see like how far they bend it's uh, it's not strange if if things would snap in there. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a yeah. Ugh. Broken ribs. <laughs> I even know of I know of not personally, and there could be a rumor mill of uh some no names will be given of just one contortion coach who like basically tries to push people to break to uh get the ribs out of the way <laughs> and then they keep training on broken ribs and then for that to adapt the bending. Jesus that's, yeah that sounds dreadful yeah <clears throat> and surprising thing it is not a west or not it's not a sorry not a westerner you'd expect to hear this kind of stuff out of the older schools of training in the east but it is a westerner of all people hmm. who uh yeah as you know rumor rumor mill so i'm not going to give any names but uh yeah interesting one all right uh yeah anyway where were we mm, yeah so like don't break don't break your ribs but if you do tell us about it yeah yeah, let, let let us know your worst rib stories. Uh, but yeah, you're going to sprain your your things, uh, your obliques or your serratus and things like that that might might happen. I actually never had much yeah. problems with that since like yeah, break dancing. Like I was pretty conditioned in the area from all the dumb stuff I'd done. Um, but yeah, I think it's also one of those ones. Just in terms of going conditioning, it's uh, particularly in the circus world, everyone just spends a huge amount of time doing fucking ab training doing crunches doing leg lifts doing all the shit dish holes no one ever really does a lot of intense side bending conditioning like mm. they might do some side crunches and all this stuff so whereas they mightn't break in one direction generally when they come to uh flag training and other stuff or deep flags or pushing it they haven't really developed this the same strong stable core as they would have developed from other stuff mm where we can debate whether the sit-ups actually gave them the core or not. <laughs> but there is just like very few movements that actually train, I suppose, your tissue capacity more than anything else in that deep side bending that people would encounter. Yeah, it, it's super specific. Like it's such a, like it's it's interesting because it, like, it doesn't really have that much like carry over to that much else either. Um, but certainly like having very good flags will also help you with like pressing on one arm and like all that, those kind of very advanced things. Uh, but like, I, I think that like, um, for speaking for kind of someone who is enthusiastic about hand balancing and wants to kind of get further into it. And after they have their one arms, there is a tendency to just train, like you train all the straight shapes, but Hey, what about like, you can easily practice flags at the same time. And I think it is a very, it's a very efficient thing to do, to, to use because you get like if you get a couple of flag shapes you you will immediately have access to a couple of others because it's essentially the same pressure you just have to um to to be able to hold and then you just configure your legs slightly differently and like the you can change the aesthetics of it rather dramatically without it being a lot heavier and um yeah like you can use kind of the thing with flags is that it's essentially just r like range of motion work where you have things such as like a straddle flag, a diamond flag, a one leg bent flag and a tuck flag kind of on the same level of of intensity in terms of how much force it would require or bend. Uh, and then yeah. you would have kind of these like where you have the, the, the top leg kind of straight out towards the side. And then you can kind of do that kind of... Uh, top leg is straight and then the the bottom leg is kind of bent up to the knee pistol flag some yeah. people call it and then you have full flag and so on so like there's um like that entire family of things is essentially just like get strong and comfortable enough with carrying all that weight outside of your uh center and then like 
you have access to so much stuff to do and yeah why not definitely it, yeah it's definitely one of those things i suppose if you were to look at the vertical configuration of the legs i hadn't actually thought about this before but i do know what you're talking about is like a straddle if my legs are on a vertical plane if i bring my legs to a diamond well most of the weight is actually still on that same vertical plane or vertical alignment mm. if i bring my legs together into a tuck from a diamond it's still on it's still basically the same vertical configuration of the weight yeah it's not like when we've done there's a bit of center mass change but not a lot it's not like when we were doing a straddle going to say a straight or even the diamond or other stuff, then suddenly you have rotational forces to deal with mm. and all this kind of thing. Whereas this, it's basically the same thing because the load is basically still distributed in the same configuration. Yeah. Or very, very, there's not a big a change, I think, in terms of what happens in, say, a straddle to a tuck. No, like the tuck flag, as all one arm tucks kind of, it, it will want to like wobble a little bit in the like rotating in the pelvis but it's it's slight it will rotate less than a normal tuck one arm will since yeah you are still in a flag so if you have a very strong diamond flag you will likely have a decent tuck flag as well just by the um, by the result of the of the control you have um <clears throat> and yeah it kind of makes sense one one, just, one uh, thing that kind of this is my how to how how should I say it? This is what I tell you all of you people that are listening to this that are doing one arms to do. Start training full flags. Meaning don't throw yourself into a full flag when if you can't do any type of flag thing, be reasonable. I'm not telling you to be an idiot here, but <laughs> a lot of people are like, "Oh no, full flag looks so difficult. I must never practice that. I am not ready." And no you should when you can do the other flag variations start working on full flag grab onto a bar on the side and start bending deep into a full flag because hey what is it going to give you it is going to give you all that strength to do all of those other flags and it is going to be a joke so um as i said again don't just go for it immediately but i think it's 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 a very useful tool for conditioning that will give you everything that you'll need for the other flags um and yeah. also i think that maybe this is just like uh, from stereotypes and so on but i think it's like full flags is looked upon very much as kind of a guy move because a lot of like strong muscle dudes do it i'm like no girls start doing full flags like i know yeah. loads of girls that can full flag uh it's just like traditionally not something that a lot of ladies might practice because of these stereotypes but like it's it's doable and like on average girls also have better side flexibility for a lot of these things so i think it's it's a great thing don't even need to use it on stage or do the, the yeah. full flag but like it'll it'll give you a lot of that conditioning and that control of the lateral dimension that will be useful so why not yeah even if you're only to train it like if you just think about like standard strength training, if you go, okay, I'll do some sets lasting 15 to 20 to 30 seconds, three sets once or twice a week would be the next level of pushing your strength up in the flagging of just training the full flag. And then you can also track your progress on it by just judging how deep you go. Mm. So make sure you pick like, okay, I'll pick a level that I can go. I'll do three reps and they'll take 10 second a rep. That's 30 seconds. And I'm only leaning to 45 degrees. Okay. Record yourself. Then next week, try to go a bit deeper. And you go, oh, I went a bit deeper. And the second and third set, it was terrible. Fine. Wait till it catches up with the first set. Then progress. This is just linear progression applied to hand balance using leverage. Mm. And it's very effective. You don't have to go all the way down. Just going part of the way down until you can get in and pull out. And then as you get stronger, you'll have access to this. And at the same time, you're not just training. It's just being treated like a strength exercise that we do it twice a week or once a week. Mm. And you get gains out of versus your normal sort of hand balance structure training where we're like, we're training for effortlessness, whereas this we're training for effort. Yeah. And it's uh, it's interesting because like we kind of forget about that sometimes in hand balance training that because we went through this process of effort and then we got to the point where the balance is essentially effortless or as close to it as it can be. And you can do a lot of it because it's so easy and you're so efficient that sometimes you have to go back and uh, sweat a little. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's it's um, <clears throat> speaking also in terms of like the actual learning of um, of flags. Um, of course, like and and this is a nice thing about flags. Like uh, I've even had like I had a student very recently now um, online who has absolutely beastly uh, side bending capacities. He has like he doesn't have the ass on the shoulder kind of thing, but he has like top-notch level side bending abilities uh, he's extremely good on two arms like he has great splits he has perfect like uh, perfect alignment he has like an l sit press on the floor like um gabriel you know who you are if you're listening um <laughs> but like he's he's basically he's really damn strong on two arms so and he was struggling with his one arm like or struggling he was learning his one arm and um What's interesting with him is that like he can fl he can basically full flag on two arms like that's the ab ability of side bending he yeah. has and the strength he has he can't do it on one arm yet because he he doesn't have the ability to control a one arm handstand to the degree that he could work there but by the time he can 15 to 20 second one arm handstand i wouldn't be surprised if he can just do a full flag because his body can be in that particular uh, situation on two arms and this is what's nice about flags. If you can do them very solidly on two arms, you will, and you can one arm handstand, you will likely have access to starting to do it on one arm rather quickly because you don't do a lot of rebalancing action, like it's more just that lock yeah. of the shoulder and stay there kind of pressure. Um, so this is why like learning to get strong on flags on two arms and also using the setup where you grab onto kind of a bar um, like a sturdy object so that you can resist uh, by kind of pulling upwards on the object. Um, so how can I describe this? Like I'll assume or like imagine that you are doing a one arm and you have grabbed a vertical bar, like let's say like a pole of some sort. Uh, and as you bend sideways towards a flag, you want to apply the pressure from your hand upwards in the pole because what this helps mitigate is the amount of pressure that the sh the balancing shoulder needs to exert to to keep its positioning. So uh, the feeling of this upwards push or or upwards pull on the bar is similar to that if you're doing a human flag, where the bottom yeah. the bottom arm is pushing and the top arm is pulling. It's kind of that type of feel when you're pulling on a bar and doing these types of exercises are excellent for for developing flag and like it'll it'll give you loads of the power that you need to actually go quite far with them yeah definitely Shit, you said something there i wanted to go back to but it has slipped my mind because i am brain dead balance of uh, two arms versus one arms and flags the, i know it was an interesting point actually on the balance in the flag so People might remember there was this kind of kid's toy of like a self-balancing bird that was like generally an eagle and it would balance on its beak because its wings were swept around behind it and you could balance it mm, on things. Right. And I always use this kind of as a comparison to what happens in a flag because we bend one, we're trying to like, I'm always like the intent I tell people when they're learning a flag is they set up and I tell them to try bend so much that they're pushing their off shoulder towards the ground at the same time that they're bending the side and it should open the shoulder angle a tiny bit possibly depress it a bit but one of the reasons is you're building the tensegrity over your balance point that you're actually kind of making yourself into one of these birds and it's kind of like a lot of the contortion shapes as well is the flag shape kind of self balances if you just don't react to your breeding and if you see someone doing a flag when they breed they'll kind of wobble a little as the torso pressurizes and depressurizes. It's not a lot, but you see it, particularly when the kind of shallow breathing people would do. And if you can just train someone just to lock the shape, lock the shoulder, push directly into the ground, and then not react to the breathing, suddenly the flag will balance itself. I'm not saying it's doing it exactly, but there's not a lot of conscious balancing going on in yeah. this position because... <clears throat> It's it's very it's very locked. I think one of my yeah. favorite things to do on stage is full flag because weight goes there, pressure goes there, that are done. Just yeah. chill. There's nothing more to be said about it. So it's like kind of 
it's one of my safest shapes as long as like I've stretched my sides but that is also like another like small side note on the end of it is this like uh, for me at least if I do my the first flag of the day will always feel stiff and terrible and it feels like oh shit I am a man that cannot flag and then the second one will feel <laughs> completely fine third and fourth one I bend as far as I can but like there will be an extreme difference in how f- far I can bend and interestingly enough it's kind of like the bending side feels crampy and nasty the first time I do it sometimes like as if like okay there is no way to go deeper into this now not because of the lengthening side but because of the compressing side and then like yeah. two flags after I'm like okay just changing leg positions in a full flag or however I want but um it's very much one where like you need to kind of get comfortable and like get the juices flowing in the area before you can kind of like max out on it so it's it's important to also be careful when learning flags of course because like you are applying a lot of force into a new area um so it's um it's something that you should take your time with even though i told you all to go and do full flags (laughs) (laughs) yeah you build up to it and uh it's always one of the things like i suppose if we go back to our strength training analogy is like you don't start with your max sets mm. you warm up a bit you try it out you test and then you work up to your max on the day mm. so you know you could do three work sets but you might do as you kind of said there, like three four sets to get into it before you're at like your operating capacity for the day mm. so take your time and train flags and train flags i suppose we should wrap it up there yeah. i think we've done the flag in depth uh yeah as usual we are handstand factory or the handstand cast by handstand factory if you want to ask us any questions for the podcast you can send them to us at handstand factory on instagram or dm them to me or mikhail as well uh you can also voice notice questions in on anchor.fm if you find our page there it's linked in all the websites we put this on uh other than that if you want to support the handstand factory you could buy us a coffee there's a link in our profile or you could buy one of our programs if you're interested in learning the art of hand balance online uh we've got some cool programs I like to think they're pretty cool. And other than that, have we got a flag problem? We haven't got a flag program. We might have a flag program at some point in time. We might, yeah. We probably need to make one based on this podcast. Yeah. Uh, other than that, so if you want to learn everything but the one arm flag, <laughs> you can uh, yeah, buy one of our programs. If you don't, uh, other than that, just thank you to listen to us ramble for this week. And uh, we'll see you soon. Cheers. Yeah.